Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Our theme at Turning Point Church this year is to stay the course. And I think this is part three. My title of my message this morning is Having Faith in Jesus, or Put Faith in Jesus, or you could even call it, Will the Real God Please Stand Up? I kind of like that, actually. Uh, Let's go to Acts chapter 20, and uh, we find Paul on his way to Jerusalem, and he's coming close by Ephesus, and he calls for the elders or the pastors of the church, the leadership, and he says in verse 17, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church, and when they had come to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you, and taught you publicly, and from house to house." It wasn't a secret thing. Paul was out in the open with everybody, not just these pastors, but he had been teaching everybody. And that's what he was saying whenever he said both publicly and from house to house, everywhere I'm going, I'm proclaiming what is helpful to you. Verse 21, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, because under the new covenant, according to Ephesians 2, there is no more Jew or Gentile. We are all one in Christ. Goes on to say, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God. We talked about that last week. Repentance toward God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all among whom I've gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. The first thing, you know, as we begin today, just to give you a, a, a little background of what we've been talking about. The first thing that Paul says before we ever get to the gospel of grace, before we ever get to the preaching of the kingdom of God, he says that we should uh, repent, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So before he ever gets to grace, before he ever gets to the ministry of the kingdom, the first thing that Paul tells us He's telling the pastors, he's told the people, is that we need to have repentance toward God. We need to change our mind about the way we see God, about the way we view God, and how we're going to change the way we see God. We're not going to just see Him as God. We're going to see Him as Father. We're going to see Him as Daddy. We're we're going to change the way we see God, and this is how we're going to do it by putting faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody say faith towards Jesus. So, one of the first things here that I want to tell you and remind you of is that Hebrews 13, 8 basically says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What that's saying is that because Jesus is like God, Jesus is God, God never changes. We do, in my understanding of God. See, in in the Old Testament, their image of God was distorted, even though they were created by God. Now think about this. Even though they were created by God, they they had a distorted picture of who God was. Jesus came into the earth to show us the Father. And I want to say it again, even even if what we're seeing in the Scriptures doesn't line up with what God, with what Jesus showed us about God, about our Father, then we need to repent, we need to change our mind about the way we view God. Repentance is about a mind shift change. 
I love what Lynn Hiles says. He says that we are one mind shift change from the kingdom operating in this moment. We're just one mind shift change. And and I'm going to say this. I know that I've said it multiple times. I'm going to keep saying it. I think it's extremely important is that Jesus is not a new version of God. Jesus is not a new version of God. God has always been like Jesus. Jesus has always been like God. And you say, well, Pastor Terry, why is it that we're in this day and we're hearing all of these things? I think that revelation is coming forth, first of all, because... uh, of the interaction of the members of the body of Christ. I think revelation is coming forth. We're understanding more. We have more access, more capability of of seeing things than we ever have. And I don't diss the great men and women of the past who've spoken into my life, who have come and gone, and thank God for all of them. They got us here, and I'm thankful for that. But I want to see Christ today. I want my mind shift to change. And, and, and we've had some great men and women that have said some great things, and they, they led us up to here, but there's more than what we've been in. And, and I want to I, I, I just say this to you. Whenever, whenever we are opening ourselves up, to something that we haven't heard or we're viewing it from a different perspective, we need to stay open. Don't get freaked out because there's a whole lot more change coming. Yeah. Yeah, there's a whole lot more change coming. And and the thing about it is, is if God is bigger than us, then we will continue to move forward. We will continue to move towards God. That's what this passage is saying. Repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. How are we going to move toward God? We're going to put faith in Jesus and everything that He showed us about God. And you say, Pastor Terry, this is a real simple message. Mm Mm-hmm. And Paul said in, in Corinthians, he said, Don't let anyone take you away from the simplicity of the gospel. I think that most of us have been hoodwinked and bamboozled to where hardly anything works the way that it's supposed to. And it's very simple is that faith in Jesus works by knowing the love of God towards your life. Faith in Jesus, faith in Jesus, seeing Jesus that He was the the exact representation of the Father causes us to release our faith. So you say, what should we concentrate on? We should concentrate on knowing God. This is eternal life, John 17. This is eternal life that you might know God. And Jesus came to show us God. God's not mad at you. He's not angry at you. He loves you. He's for you. He's not causing your problems. He is releasing you out of them. (laughs) That's good news. And he wants to help us. See, old, old, old mindsets that we have can't access the kingdom. And, and Jesus said things like, you can't put new wine in old wineskins. Get rid of all of it. Because the new wine will burst the old wine skin. Let go of those old mindsets. When you look at Jesus, you put faith in Jesus. You change your mind as you see Jesus in his physical representation, as you see him in a physical body, as we see him in the scriptures in a physical body, we begin to change our mind about who the Father is. This was, this was a very evident uh, part of the ministry of Paul is getting everyone to put faith in Jesus and under, getting everyone to understand that it was God in a physical body. 
God was walking with us for 33 and a half years. It was God. There wasn't, there wasn't nine gods, 12 gods, three gods, two gods. There was one God living in a body. Amen. Turn over to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That it, we access the kingdom. Love energizes faith. We access the kingdom of God. We access grace by understanding how much God loves us and us experiencing that love in our emotions, in our soul. Do you know that God de doesn't ever look at us and go, oh man, I'm just disgusted. Never. Now I know you and I look at each other sometimes like that. Come on. That's just, I just can't believe you did that. But God never does that. And I believe that if we begin to operate within the nature of God in our lives, then we won't look at each other like that. And I'll tell you, the key to all that is for you not to look at yourself like that. We look at ourselves like we're disgusting. You are not disgusting. You are lovable. Look at somebody and say, can't you tell I'm lovable? Come on, you're lovable. Now, now let me say this, as, a, as I'm, I'm just, this is my opening statement. <laughs> yeah, baby. In, in, as we're talking about, as we're talking about Paul and as we're talking about uh, putting faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, putting faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul talks a lot about, uh, in his writings, about faith, about faith being a gift. He talks about different aspects of faith. Uh, in, the, in Paul's epistles, faith appears 171 times in 160 verses. So Paul talks a lot about faith. Paul's ministry was about er showing everyone that Jesus was the Christ. He was God in a physical body, that Jesus was the Father in a physical body, that the Father and Jesus were one in a physical body. Everybody say faith in one God. Turn over to Colossians. And I'm just praying this morning, as I always pray, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. If you don't understand something that I'm saying, give it time. You know, sometimes I take, it takes me months, maybe even years, for me to even get up here and say what I'm saying, and I expect you to get it today. Come on now. Look at somebody and say, give me a break. But I do believe that the Spirit of God is breathing on us where we can understand greater than we ever have. But what I'm saying is don't get freaked out if I'm presenting something that you've never thought or you've never heard. Don't run out the back door away from me. Run towards me. See, we're always running from stuff. We're running from the law. We're running from this. We're running from that. Don't run from stuff, run toward God. Run toward Jesus. Run toward your pastor. That was pretty good. I like that. That's, yeah. <laughs> Everybody say run. <laughs> Colossians chapter 1 and verse uh, 26. This was the ministry of Paul. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations. But now, this was 2,000 years ago. Wow. But now has been revealed, unveiled to his saints, and Paul's writing about it, to them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles too, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus to this to this end, I also labor, striving according to His working, which is working in me mightily. Christ 
in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I, I, I'm going to have to have faith in Jesus and what he showed me about the Father, that him and the Father were in union with each other. Can I be as, as bold as this to say that you and God are in union with each other today? Not going to be someday, but you're in union with God right now. And not only are we in union with God, but we are in union with each other. That's powerful. Everybody say one Lord. I want to say it again. Jesus is not the new version of God. I know what you see in the Old Testament but I'm going to tell you right now, Jesus was presenting the way that God was always. Now, I know that we're going to have to work through some issues and thinking in our own mind about a number of things. I'm not throwing out the Old Testament. I'm just saying that we ought to be seeing Jesus in the Old Testament because whenever Jesus was on the road to Emmaus, after he was resurrected, he opened up the law and the prophets and he told those guys the whole Bible, that, that all they had was the Old Testament, the whole Bible, everything in that, in that Old Testament was pointing to me. It was about me. The law and the prophets spoke of Jesus. Everybody say one Lord. Now I'm going to go through, I think they've got these scriptures. I'm going to go through these fairly quick. So uh, Deuteronomy 6.4. Let's see how, here we go. Deuteronomy 6.4. Everybody say the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Not two, not three, not five, not ten, not twelve. The Lord is one. Everybody say one. Zechariah 14.9. Zechariah 14.9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be the Lord is one and his name one. Everybody say God is one. Mark chapter 12 and verse 29. I just want to keep, I could do this for a while. Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Amen. See, Israel was having a hard time looking at Jesus and saying, this is God. Because they were seen in a physical realm, they were seeing a physical man, and they were thinking God was in the temple, but God was living in this physical man. Mm -mm. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and, who, and through whom we live. Is there, is there a physical Jesus? Was He on the earth? Yes, for 33 and a half years. Is Jesus a physical Jesus? No, he is a spirit. God is spirit. He is in the invisible realm. That invisible realm is on the inside of you. That invisible realm is more real than the realm that we are currently existing in. That realm created this realm. That realm will overtake this realm. I like that. Ephesians 4, 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Everybody say one Lord. 1 John 5, 7. 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. So no matter what you think you see in the physical realm, God is one, and God is one living on the inside of you. Amen. I know what everybody else says. I don't really care what everybody else says. Jesus is not a new version of the God of the Old Testament. Now, I want to read this out of the Mirror Bible. Uh, I got my new Mirror Bible this week. Um, it says in Hebrews 1, 1, Throughout ancient times, God spoke in many fragments and glimpses of prophetic thought to our fathers. Now this entire conversation has finally dawned 
in sonship. Suddenly what seemed to be ancient language falls fresh and new like the dew on the tender grass. He is the sum total of every utterance of God, Jesus. He is the sum total of every utterance of God. He is God. He is whom the prophets pointed to, and we are His immediate audience. In sonship, God declares the incarnate Word to be the heir of all things. He is, after all, the author of the ages. We have our beginning and our being in Him. Remember what I said last week? Ephesians 1 says that we were in Christ before the foundations of the world. And you say, Pastor Terry, who was in Christ before the foundations of the world? Everybody. <laughs> Sorry. I just had a little, that was a little joy bubble that came up there. Uh, listen to this. Uh, I wish I would have wrote this. Jesus is the crescendo of God's conversation. He gives context and content to the authentic thought. Everything that God had in mind for mankind is voiced in Him. Jesus is God's language. He is the radiant and flawless expression of the person and the intent of God. He mirrors God's character and exhi exhibits His every attribute in human form. He is the voice of God announcing our redeemed innocence in Him. By His own doing, He accomplished purification for sins and sat down enthroned in the boundless measure of His majesty in the right and of God as the executive authority, the force of the universe, upholding everything that exists. His voice is the dynamic that sustains the entire cosmos, the universe. Everybody say the universe. How many of you remember, you know, when it, what we're talking about this morning is having faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ? That's pretty simple. Um, faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith in who He was and who He showed us that He was. Who He showed us that the Father was faith in Jesus. And, and here we come through approximately 4,000 years of, of Old Testament stuff. The Jews had been under the law for 1,500 years. Matter of fact, turn over to uh, Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. Before we ever get to the gospel of grace, before we ever get to preaching the kingdom of God, we've got to settle some issues about having faith in Jesus and having, having an understanding that we need to change the way we see the Father. He's not just God, He's your daddy. And, and here we have 4,000 years of, of Old Testament stuff going on, and in Matthew uh, chapter 17, verse 10, uh, it's, and it says there, and His disciples ask Him, saying, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him uh, whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is about to suffer at their hands. The disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. See, there was, there was something going on in their day John the Baptist was the last priest of that old covenant that gave way to the high priest of the new covenant. Man, there's a lot in there. But I'm going I'm to tell you right now, whenever, Jesus, whenever John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world, John was preaching, The kingdom of God is at hand. It's near. There's the kingdom. His name is Jesus. He's God. 
I mean, that had to be mind-boggling to them. Because what they saw of God in the Old Testament was usually just spirit, a voice. Hello? He said, Elijah has already come and he's introduced me, the living God, to the entire planet. He's introduced me and, and I am going to change the way everybody sees my father. I'm going to change the way everybody looks at themselves. I'm going to change every, everything that you think about other people, the way you view things. And, and the, the disciples knew about this Old Testament God that they thought they knew about. Turn over to Luke chapter 9, and I know you've heard me preach this before, but I, I'm gonna, I want to say it this morning with what I'm talking about. Luke chapter 9, and verse 51. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, Jesus, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And messengers went before his face, and as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? Elijah in the Old Testament. But wait a minute. The, Elijah has already come and showed up and said, Behold the Lamb of God. There was a mind, there should, be, there should have been a mind shift change going on 2,000 years ago. There was. There should be a mind shift change going on today in between our ears in the way that we see the Father. And what did, what did these disciples do? Do you want us to call fire down out of heaven just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and he said, for you do not know what manner of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives but to save, save them. And they went to another village. Jesus didn't come to destroy people. He came to save us. And I'm going to tell you, he saved us. He's already done that. It's already a done deal. Everybody say done deal. But these disciples thought they could do that. I mean, they'd already been healing the sick and raising the dead and casting out devils. They'd already been doing that. So why couldn't they call a little fire down out of, out of heaven? But see, what's coming down out of heaven isn't destruction from the hands of men. It's restoration from the hands of God. And God isn't way out there somewhere. God is doing it from an inside position, from on the inside of you. <laughs> Ooh, I'm, I'm feeling really good this morning. But don't you want to call a little fire down on somebody? See, you need to have a mind shift change. You need to have a mind shift change. You're to love people. But Pastor Terry, I don't want to love my enemies. God said, love your enemies. But see, we haven't even believed that God will love His. And I'm telling you, God loved His. Yeah, that's right. We saw that whenever Jesus stretched His arms out and He said, Father, forgive them. In this physical body, they don't know what they're doing to you and me, to us, to me. One Lord. Everybody say love. Now let's, let's uh, let me see. Let's go over to uh, John chapter 13. John chapter 13. And let's um, see, we're still talking about having faith in, faith in Jesus. Everybody say faith in Jesus. Faith toward Jesus. That's, 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 that's what I want you to be thinking here. See, Jesus was changing the disciples' mindset to not destroy, but to restore. Wow. Listen to this. This is in chapter 13, and I want to I pick it up with, uh, 
let's um, actually let's start with verse 31 and then I'm going to read quite a few verses. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer in the flesh, in the physical. You will seek me, and as I said to, to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come, so now, to I, so now I say to you. So where was Jesus going? Now, in, as we read through chapter 13 and into chapter 14, I know what most of us think, that Jesus was going to heaven. It does not say heaven at all. Keep going. Where I am going, you cannot come. Where was Jesus going? He wasn't going to heaven. He was going to the cross. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? These guys didn't get it either. It took them a while. Come on now. Look at somebody and say, give yourself a break. Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now. But you shall follow me afterward, after the resurrection. You shall follow me afterward. You can't go to the cross. You can't, you can't go where I'm going. But after all of this is over, you will follow me. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you, for your sake. Jesus answered him, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Wow. Who's Jesus talking to right here? Who? Okay. I know we have a chapter break, but there's no chapter break. Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. But Peter, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God? You believe in the Creator? You believe in the God of Israel? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Okay, I want you to believe in me. And then he says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now, here's my picture of this for most of my life. I pictured we couldn't go where Jesus was going. He was going to heaven, and he had, he had his uh, carpenter's tool belt on, and he was finishing all the mansions in heaven. And it's sure taken him a long time to build mansions up there. This word, this word mansions appears twice in this particular passage of Scripture. It's the only two times in the New Testament. And it's, they should have translated it abode. They did in verse 23, but they should have translated it abode here in verse 2. In my Father's house are many abodes. Now stay with me this morning. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Nowhere does this say, I'm going to heaven. Matter of fact, the whole New Testament isn't about going to heaven. The whole, the whole New Testament is about heaven coming to earth. Heaven, kingdom of God being within us. Right. 
Listen, Jesus wasn't talking about where you go when you die. He was talking about where you're going to go when he died. Should I say that again? Jesus wasn't talking about where you go when you die. And I'm not taking heaven away from us. I am saying there is a realm of the Spirit all around us. It's more real than this realm. But I'm saying in this passage of Scripture, He's not talking about building mansions on streets of gold in outer space. He's talking to Peter who is about to make a bad boo-boo and deny him three times. And he says, Peter, don't let your heart be troubled because you can't go where I'm going. I'm going to the cross and then I'm going to die and I'm going to be resurrected and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to live on the inside of you. Do you see that? He didn't say if I go away. See, see, what's going on here is he's talking about resurrection life being on the inside of us. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Jesus has been telling them everything that I'm going to do is so that I can come and live on the inside of you. And you say, Pastor Terry... How much are we going to have to hear this? We're going to have to hear this until it rattles our cage. Amen. That God is here with us. He's living in us. Listen, whenever I was growing up in the Southern Baptist Church, I remember people testifying, and I, and I remember people, you know, saying, well, all I want is just to make it through this life and just have a little shack in the corner of glory. And us teenagers were sitting back there in the back saying, I don't want no shack. What's wrong with these old people? Come on now. You can have your shack. I, I, listen, I don't need a shack. I got the living God abiding in me. I am His abode. He has cleansed me. He's done everything that He needed to do to the human race so that He could come and live in me. He isn't going back to the cross. He isn't going to accomplish anything else. It's already done. In all honesty, whenever I know that a lot of people think the King James Version is, is the version that Jesus read. If it was good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for us. I, I, I'm going to tell you, you need to rethink that thought process. Uh, because in 1611, whenever they translated this word abode, they should have translated it abode. In my Father's house are many abodes. We're the Father's house. We're the abodes. We're the place that He lives in. And I know that I could say it a number of ways, but what I'm wanting you to get this morning is what He is saying to Peter is, you believe in God, just don't believe in God. Believe in me. Because I've showed you what God is like. And we're going to come and we're going to make our abode on the inside of you. Look down at verse 23. It says, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our, here it says, home, our abode with him. The Father and the Son living in us as one. According to According to uh, 2 John 1, 9, it's the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine of Christ is the Father and the Son living in you as one. Amen. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We just don't have a third of God. We have all of God living in us. All of Him and all of me. I'm wall to wall, Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the Father and the Son living in me as spirit, as one. That's right. Think about it. I didn't really, even though, even though we taught being an overcomer, even though we taught about victory, I really, in my own mind, I never thought we could have victory until we either got raptured out, which I don't believe in, by the way, uh, as most of you know. I don't believe that there's a rapture. I believe in the resurrection. 
And the resurrection is in me right now. The person of the resurrection is in me. God Himself is living in me. Not going to live in me. He's with me everywhere I go. Everything I do. He doesn't ever leave me. He doesn't ever forsake me. He's with me. And does that make me want to go do whatever I want to do? No, it makes me want to run to God. The more I know about Him. See, Jesus was going to, to the cross to prepare an abode. You're it. Jesus said, where I'm at, you will be. Where I'm at, you will. See, see what happens is we have heard other things for so long that it's hard for us to get our mind wrapped around something. But here's the thing. You've got to hear somebody say it for you to be able to even begin to think outside of the box that you have been in. Because God is not limited to your box. He is in your box. He will get in your box, whatever your box looks like. But God's box is really, 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 really big. Really big. So I don't want to just stay in this minute box and think that everybody has known everything that we will ever know. No! We are gaining and growing and understanding. And we have to be open. We have to look at things. And so sometimes things have to be thrown out on the table in order for us to begin to think outside of the box that we've been in. I, I mean, this is amazing right here. Because, let, let me keep reading. Verse 5 of chapter 14. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Wow. Are you kidding me? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to heaven except through me. Huh? See, that's the way we've read it. Oh, boy. That's the way we've read it. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You'll never recognize God if you don't go through Jesus. And the Jews didn't recognize God. The Gentiles who weren't even in the covenants of promise, they immediately, began, like Cornelius, he began to recognize God because he saw Jesus. The Gentiles begin to come in. Paul told the Jews, he said, since you're not going to listen to me, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. <laughs> if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you'd known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him, and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. That'll be enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He has seen me, who has seen me, has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak by my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me, He does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. See, I want you to come to God. And you know why... You know why the earth, you know why the planet hadn't come to God? If we show them Jesus, if we show them the love of Jesus that he portrayed in his life, the earth will come to know God. What the church has done is we have shown a harsh, mean, nasty God. We have not presented a daddy to the human race. And you say, well, is God their daddy too? God is just as much their daddy as he is yours. He's a good father. 
I mean, listen, I, I grew up in church. I've been, I, 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 I've, I've been in the ministry. This is my 38th year, I believe. 1981, I, yeah, 38 years this year. And I've sat under messages and, and sat in services where people beat the hell out of me. And I was disgusted with myself. Nobody told me who I was in Jesus. Everybody was about my performance. See, God, God was changing everybody's mindset by coming on the scene and doing something that wasn't about your performance. It was about the performance of one man that had God living in him that did everything for everybody. And he said, here it is. No strings attached. No strings attached. None. Pastor, do you feel it this morning? Yeah. Yeah. Because see, this is the whole body of Christ for the most part. It's always been about getting us from here to there. We've preached a, a message that has tried to get us from here to there rather than enjoying the salvation of God in our midst right now. We've told people, you're not going to go to heaven because you haven't done this. You're not going to heaven because you haven't done that. You're not going to heaven, you're going to hell because you've done too much of this. It's about none of it. It's ne if it's not about your works today, it's never been about your works. It wasn't about works in the Old Testament, that's what they thought. It isn't about works in the New Testament. It is about the work of one man. It is about the work of one man with God living in him and him doing something for the entire human race. Where Adam failed, Jesus prevailed. Can you hang one more scripture? Okay, I'm almost done. Hebrews. Chapter 6, and, I, and I'm just going to make the statement as I end today, because there's so much stuff in here. Chapter 6 and verse 1, therefore leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Not, we, we should, let, let's not go over this again, repentance, change your mind about dead works. Your works don't get you anywhere with God. And I know you've read the next part of that. Look at this. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and a faith toward God. We're to put faith in Jesus. We're to repent or change our mind about God by seeing Jesus. And this says for us not to go back and put faith towards God. Who did they believe in? They believed that he was the creator they believed that he was holy. They believed that he was just. But everything that Paul was teaching is, he was saying, you got to look at Jesus. Don't go back to faith in God. Don't, don't go back to that. We're, we're moving on. There's a new thing. His name is Jesus. There's a new person. And he showed us something different. Amen. You may have to think about this a little bit. Don't go back to the faith of the God. They believed that God was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They believed a lot of things about God that wasn't right. Go, don't go back to faith toward God of that old covenant that you believed in. Put your faith in Jesus. Repent. Change your mind about God. Because if you're putting faith in Jesus, you're putting faith in the real God. Will the real God please stand up? Most of the church today has faith in a God who is harsh, mean, nasty, will not forgive their enemies. And God expects you to forgive your enemies, but He won't forgive His. I think we've got some things definitely out of line. And I'm not the only one saying this. There's a lot of people that are saying this. 
There's a lot of people that are waking up. There's a lot of people that are hungry, not after the message of a works performance-based gospel that has a mean God at the head of it, but we are under a grace-based gospel that is about the kingdom manifesting here in our midst. But the kingdom will not manifest the way that it should until you change your mind about the way you see God. The church should automatically be flowing with health and wholeness and healing. This shouldn't be difficult. We think we have to pray it up, work it up, intercede it out to get God to move. No, we don't. Listen, guys, don't even go, nobody even go there with me. I've been doing this for 38 years. I've fasted for 11 days, 12 days, 7 days, 3 days to try to get God to do something. I've prayed for hours upon hours upon hours to try to get God to do something. And you know all I got out of that was, well, a little skinnier. And I'm not, I'm not against spiritual disciplines, but I'm against spiritual disciplines whenever you do it to get God to move. He's already done it, and He's living in you. Are you all okay this morning? <laughs> Have I made partial sense this morning? <laughs> Woo. I'm going to tell you right now that our greatest days are ahead. Our greatest days are ahead. Some of the most fantastic things in the physical realm that we have ever seen is going to manifest in our moment, in our day. And you say, why? Is it because of Pastor Terry's holiness? No, it's because of His holiness that is living in me. I am righteous and truly holy. Not through my performance or through my effort, but through the gift of God that has been given to me. And you're as righteous and as holy as I am. And I'm as righteous and holy as you are. And we're as righteous and holy as God is. Woo! Woo! You are like God, even in this present world, in this present moment. You have the healing power of God in you. Not just a preacher in the pulpit, you do. You got God living in you. And you have purpose. You have a reason for living. And God is going to partner with us to do great things. And this isn't about me. I was talking to Davey just a few minutes before I started preaching. This isn't about me. You know what I want? I want some of us old people to get out of the way. And you say, well, pastor, you're not that old. Just hear me out. This has always been my heart. I want us old people to get out of the way, get our bad mindsets changed, to give hope to a young generation that is coming yeah. forward. I want to see this church. I want to see old people coming to this church. But I, see, I want to see young people coming to this church that, that are hearing something that God believes in you, so much so that He's living in you. Look at somebody and say, God is my Father. So I think we ought to put faith in Jesus. Would you agree? I think we ought to take another look at everything that we believe, everything that we think. And quit listening to the same four people that you've listened to for the last 38 years. They're not saying anything differently. Go listen to somebody outside of your genre. I can give you some names of people that'll... You think I'm saying some stuff. I, I can give you some names of people that'll blow your socks off. Are you listening to me? And I think I'm doing a pretty good job myself. But this isn't about one person. This is about the body of Christ rising in the glory of God that we are. And God is glorified. He was glorified, but He's glorified in you today. He is glorified in you today. He loves you, and He wants to express Himself through you. How, why don't you stand up with me? 
<laughs> I can't help but laugh. I can't believe I was as stupid as I've been. Come on now. Come on now. But we just bought in to what everybody told us without really looking deeper. We just bought into what everybody had already said. And I'm not telling you to buy into what I'm saying. I'm saying go, go to God that's living on the inside of you and let Him talk to you. Are you listening to me? Father, I thank You that as we leave here today, we leave charged, we leave energized, we leave challenged. But Father God, most of all, we leave knowing that You love us. And we put faith in Jesus so that we can change our mind about You in the name of Jesus. And everybody that agreed said, everybody that agreed said, everybody that agreed said, everybody that agreed said,